Welcome to the second in a series of lectures. Um, so the second one is entitled The Conversion and Early History of Armenia. Uh, but let's review first a little bit from last time. So last time, if you were here, you will recall that we made some general remarks about the Armenian historical tradition as a continuous whole from the fifth century up until the early modern period. And along the way, identified several features that the Armenian historians share in common with one another. These are a guide to understanding the subjectivities and agenda of the various Armenian historians, which arose out of their particular geographic, social, and religious context. First is the biblical Christian worldview shared by all the authors, arising from the fact that the alphabet itself was invented as a tool for Christianization, and that for most of pre-modern Armenian history, writing remained in the purview of the clerical class of society. Secondly, we noted some of the particulars as to the political and cultural situation of Armenia during the formative period of Armenian Christian literature, how the Armenian realm was a contested and geographically divided space between the Sasanian and East Roman empires, with most of the Armenian Commonwealth belonging to the Iranian sphere, how the Arshakuni kingdom came to an end in the first half of the fifth century, and how thereafter the Sasanians attempted to impose the imperial form of Zoroastrianism on the Christian Nafarars, noble lords of Armenia, some of whom accepted and some of whom resisted. And how all of this lends a severely anti-Iranian, anti-Zoroastrian and pro-Roman, pro-Christian bias to many of the historical works. Further, we discuss the oral pre-Christian literature and culture of traditional Armenian society and how the Armenian historians were consciously competing with and trying to replace that worldview and its literature, redefining its key terms and values in order to present a newly imagined presentation of reality to the Armenian people in line with the Judeo-Christian worldview that also retained in altered form the main values of Armenian culture. We also mentioned that each historian is generally sponsored by a patron with his or her own agenda, which we should always be conscious of. We noted that, uni that unity among the noble lords is a key theme of the Armenian historians, in part because the Armenian noble families were so rarely united in pursuing what was best for the people as a whole. Finally, we noted how each historian wrote with a moral purpose in mind, aiming not just to inform, but to transform their readers into the ideal Armenian Christians who would see all things as connected with their larger divine purpose and would be inspired to labor on the side of good in the perpetual battle between good and evil that rages in the world and in every human heart. This time we'll look at a few of the early Armenian histories and read selections from their works. So the first we're gonna consider is the history of Armenia by Agathangelos which chronicles, chronicles the conversion of King Turdot and the Armenian realm to Christianity at the beginning of the fourth century and the evangelizing mission of Gregory the Illuminator. This work became popular across the Christian world with translations and alternate versions sur surviving in Arabic, Ethiopian, Greek, Latin, and Syriac. And you can see on the slide here, uh, some of the publications of this work. So the one on the left, which um, I brought a copy of here, is the translation and commentary by Robert Thompson made in 1976, uh, English on one side, Armenian on the other. Um, there's also, as part of, part of this larger work, which wasn't included in this translation, is the teaching of St. Gregory, um, about which I'll say a few words. One of the important um, early theological uh, books. In, the manuscript, in some of the manuscripts that forms uh, a middle section of Agathangelos' history itself, but you can find it published separately. This book is hard to find, and I don't think it's in print anymore, but this one is, and you can uh, find and order it, and St. Nersa Seminary uh, published it. Uh, this is the second edition of Robert Thompson's uh, translation. And then um, there's The Lives of St. Gregory, which is a comparison between the Armenian version, the Greek, Arabic, and Syriac versions. I couldn't find that 
that one in the St. Nurses Library or the Zohrab Library, actually. Um, but there's, I did find uh, the Greek version uh, of Agathangelo, so translation made from the Armenian. Um, you can see, so there's not a whole lot of works uh, originally composed in Armenian that were translated to Greek. So that's kind of a unique feature of this uh, in its own right. So who is this text? Who, who is this? Uh, who is this author? What is this text? So we don't know who the actual author of this work was. He calls himself Agathangelos, which in Greek means messenger of good tidings. This is a symbolic name having more to do with the content of the work itself, the Christianization of Armenia, than with the actual identity of the author. What does the author say about himself? So the history purports to be an eyewitness account commissioned by the Armenian king Derdat to chronicle fourth century events. In the lengthy prologue that opens his history, he writes, now a command came to me, one Agathangelos from the great city of Rome, trained in the art of the ancients, proficient in Latin and Greek, and not unskilled in literary composition. Thus we came to the Arsacid court in the region of the brave, virtuous, mighty, and heroic Turdot, who has surpassed all his ancestors in valor, and who has done deeds in battle worthy of champions and giants. He ordered us to narrate, not a falsified account of his own brave deeds, nor unworthily to elaborate capricious fables, but what really occurred in various times. Already a problem arises. If the alphabet was not invented until the early fifth century, what language was Agathangelos writing in at the command of King Turdot almost a hundred years before? Presumably Greek, one of the languages in use at the Arsacid court, as of course the East Roman Empire. That's why he presents himself as well-versed in Greek. And, and that's what the later Armenian tradition claimed about the work saying it was then translated into Armenian in the fifth century. The problem is that it is obvious to philologists who have studied the text that it is not a translation from Greek, but an original composition in Armenian. And furthermore, certain aspects of the text betray a late fifth or even sixth century date for its composition as we have it in its final form. In fact, given what we know about fourth century Armenian history from other sources, including one we'll consider next, it is clear that much of the material in Agathangelos's work is made up and not historically accurate. It also erases or fails to mention things that did happen. For example, it gives no mention of Christianity before Gregory the Illuminator downplays the role of Syriac influence in early evangelization efforts in Armenia, gives all the credit to the Greek influence Gregory, and acts as if Christianization happened across the realm in one fell swoop. Likewise, he emphasizes the ecclesiastical center of Valar Shapat, Etchmiadzin, over and against the earlier fourth century center of Armenian Christianity at Ashtishat, to the southwest, and in a more Syriac influence milieu. By means of Gregory's famous vision of Christ descending with a golden hammer in hand, striking the spot where the cathedral of Etchmiadzin was to be built. We should see this pro-Greek, pro-Roman bias and the presentation of Armenia as a totally Christian realm, as a kind of wishful thinking projection coming from the author's late fifth century setting which was marked by the Sasanian Zoroastrian incursion into Armenia and the Armenian realm's divided loyalties between Christianity and Zoroastrianism. Agathangelos wants to present Christianity as the true religion of all Armenia, united together as God's people. So what do we make of all this? As mentioned in the previous lecture, when it comes to understanding certain features of these texts, we're sometimes better off when we think of them as literature, employing compelling literary devices in order to give their texts immediacy and power. In films and novels, we speak of a suspension of disbelief, a kind of unspoken pact made between author and audience to enter into the narrative world and judge the story not 
on its scientific or historical accuracy, but on its own terms, as a good and compelling story or not. To make the narrative all the more exciting and gripping, the author presents himself as one who was really there, who saw everything with his own eyes, and now is telling you the truth, just as it happened. This is a device so common to literature that it has its own term, the witness narrator. One famous modern example may be found in the late Italian novelist and philosopher Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose, a gripping murder mystery set in a 14th century monastery, which employs a similar literary device at the outset of the book, as it claims to be the translation of an eyewitness account produced in medieval Latin from one who lived through the events back then. Well, let's take a look at the contents of Agathongelos's work. So here is an outline of the work on the screen that I prepared by modifying the chapter divisions from Robert Thompson's translation, just so you have an idea of the overall contents. The history weaves together many different traditions and sources, and for that reason, its compositional structure is a little bit complex. The narrative begins with the murder of the Arsacid king Khosrov of Armenia by Gregory's own father, Anak, a Parthian noble who carried out the deed in service of the Sasanian king Ardashir. Both Grigor and Khosrov's son Terdat were then raised in the Roman Empire, the former Gregory as a Christian in Caesarea in Cappadocia. Through the intervention of Emperor Diocletian, Turdot is established on the Armenian throne and Gregory enters into his service without revealing his background as the son of the king's murdered father. I think I mixed that up. <laughs> Gregory's Christian identity is discovered when he refuses to engage in the worship of Anahi, goddess associated with fertility, waters, wisdom, and victory, and is then tortured and imprisoned in the deep pit, Horvirat, uh, at Ardasha which I'm sure many of you have been to in Armenia. The next episode relates the escape of a group of 35 female monastics led by their abbess Gayane from Roman territory, sparked by Diocletian's attempt to forcefully marry one of the virgins named Herypsime. King Turdat, whom Diocletian has requested to find and return the virgins to him, is himself struck by Herypsime's beauty and seeks to possess her for himself but he is overpowered by her in a wrestling match. The virgin monastics are then martyred and Durdat is subsequently transformed into a wild boar as divine punishment for his crime. After 15 years in the pit, Gregory is brought out and heals the king, who along with his royal entourage accept Christianity. At this point, a lengthy catechetical discourse is inserted known as the teaching of St. Gregory, which we showed before. So taking the form of Gregory's instruction on biblical salvation history and Christian doctrine to Turdot before his baptism, the teaching is a key source for understanding the theology of the early Armenian church and its impact on subsequent Armenian theology was profound. The rest of the history treats Gregory's consecration as bishop in Caesarea, the baptism of Turdot, the court and nobles, and thousands of Armenians, for which reason Gregory is called the illuminator his overthrow and destruction of pagan temples, the consecration of martyria and churches, the evangelization of the Armenian realm, and finally, the participation of his son and successor, Aristakes, at the Council of Nicaea. Scenes from the compelling episodes in this history have been depicted in medieval manuscripts and continue to be so depicted to this day in the frescoes and stained glass windows of contemporary churches. And so we'll look together at one of the famous episodes. Um, the portion that I've translated here for us to look at is excerpted from the cycle relating the martyrdom of Hrypsime and her fellow virgin monastics, whose cult was later widely celebrated in Armenia, as I'm sure some of you uh, know and have been to two of the earliest churches in Armenia, um, which are dedicated to St. Hrypsime and St. Gayame in and around uh, Etchmiadzin. So, Herypsime has been captured and is imprisoned by King Turdat, who now enters into her chamber to try to have his way with her. While Saint Herypsime was offering all these prayers to God, 
King Tardot came and entered into the room where she had been confined. And when he came and entered within, the people all together, some outside the palace and others in the streets, took to singing out songs, leaping about clapping and forming a parade. Some filled the citadel and others the city square with festivity. They were all expecting to celebrate the wedding with dancing and revelry. But the Lord God looked down on his beloved Hurepsime to rescue her, so that what had been entrusted to her, what she had guarded so carefully, i.e. her virginity, would not be lost. And he heard her prayers and strengthened her like Jael and, Je and Deborah. He gave her strength so that she would be delivered from the cruel assault of the tyrant. Now when the king entered, he forcefully seized her to fulfill his lustful desire. But she, strengthened by the Holy Spirit, fought like a wild beast and battled like a man. They fought beginning from the third hour up until the 10th, so from sunrise almost till sunset, until she defeated the king, he who was known for his incredible strength. While he was in the Greek realm, he had amazed all by demonstrating his great muscular strength. And in his own realm, after he had returned to his native land, he had shown there many mighty deeds of valor. But he who was so famous in every way was now overcome and defeated by a single girl through the will and power of Christ. After he was defeated, he went out fatigued and weakened. Hurepsime battled yet more with Terdot from the 10th hour until the first evening watch and she defeated him. And the girl was strengthened by the Holy Spirit. She struck him, repelled him, and defeated him. She made the king exhausted, weakened him, and threw him down. She stripped the clothes off the king, tore his robe to shreds, plundered his royal diadem, and cast it away, and left him utterly shamed. This is essentially a reversal of a typical rape scene that would happen after an ancient battle. So when you go and conquer and take a city, the soldiers would then go and have their way with the women and plunder all their goods, steal everything from the house and essentially rape the women. And so here we see the exact opposite happening. And although her own dress had been reduced to tatters by him, yet when she emerged victorious outside, she had preserved her chastity intact. And forcefully opening the doors of the house, she went outside, tearing through the crowd of people, and no one was able to subdue her. She ran through the city square and went up to the eastern side and through the sun gate of the city. She came to the wine storage where their earlier monastic dwelling had been and announced to her companions what had happened. Then she went off a long way from the city to the northeast, to a high and sandy summit close to the main road, which led to the city of Ardashat. When she arrived there, she knelt in prayer and said, Lord of all, who is able to repay you for your blessings, which you have granted to us? For you have kept firm our hope that was in you, and you have delivered us from the filthy teeth of the wild beast who is trying to defile us. But what more is there that we can offer you in exchange for your salvation, but our very beings? For you yourself have made us worthy to serve you, and to bear your name by which you delivered us. For we know no other but you, O Lord, and we call your name all day long. And while blessed Saint Herypsime was saying all this, that same night the king's nobles with the chief executioner and the torturers soon arrived there with torches lit before them. They rushed towards her, tied her hands behind her back, and sought to cut out her tongue. But she of her own will opened her mouth and offered her tongue. Then they stripped off the torn garment that hung about her, hammered four stakes into the ground, two for her hands and two for her feet, and stretched her out on them. And they brought the torches right up to her for a long time, burning and roasting her body with the torches fire. They dropped stones on her bosom, emptied out her entrails, and while she was still alive, tore out the Blessed One's eyes. Then they cut her to pieces limb by limb, saying, all who dare to despise and disparage the royal commands will perish in the same way. And there were other holy ones, men and women, who had come with them, more than 70 people. And at that time, they put to the sword and slaughtered 32 of those who had come there, seeking to wrap and bury her body. 
those said this, we have loved you, O Lord, because you will hear the voice of our prayers. You have inclined your ear, O doer of good, and we will call out to you. Glory to you who did not deprive us who are unworthy of your blessings, O lover of humans, who preserved us as the apple of your eye and under your sheltering wings saved us from these many crimes. And now we die for your glorious name. After saying this with one voice, together they breathe their last. So as I mentioned, um, so there's the reversal of the typical rape scene. One of the things that also obviously stands out and is striking in this narrative is that how the Christian weak, you know, the 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 girl, the young girl, is is stronger than the strongest of the non-Christians. So Hurepsime, the woman, is able to defeat Terdot, the king, who earlier in the work, it had gone on and on about how strong he was. And so you can see how this text, with its vivid depiction, it's like watching a powerful movie, uh, the way everything's described. You can see how it held such power. The whole thing is narrated with such striking details and memorable visual scenes. And think about the kind of context it was read in. This is fifth century Armenia or later. Martyrdom is not a thing of the past that they're looking back at as, oh, that just happened to the early Christians. It's happening to them right then. And that part about uh, all who despise and disparage the royal commands will perish in the same way. Okay, that's talking about Turdot and whatever, but if you're reading that in the fifth century, who are you thinking of? The Sasanian Shah Yazgert, who's commanding that you either give up Christianity or die. So these texts um, with these scenes have been used and read uh, by many, many generations of Armenians who have faced similar circumstances uh, throughout history. And we can talk more about it uh, at the end or hear some of your reactions. The next history for us to consider issues from a very different milieu. Pafstos Buzant is the name given to a history of the fifth century, which narrates the tumultuous events of the fourth century. From the death of Gregory the Illuminator and King Turdot to the succession of their heirs on the patriarchal and royal thrones, up to the partition of Armenia between Byzantium and Sasanian Iran in 387 AD. Due to a misunderstanding of the term Buzant, it was long thought that the author was from the city of Constantinople, Byzantium. So the author is generally referred to as Paustos Buzantatsi, Faustus of Byzantium. This was a misunderstanding already promulgated by Hazar, uh, writing around the year 500, who, by the way, didn't like this work at all and said it wasn't worthy of someone from that great city. In fact, the author is anonymous and the text is titled Uzandaran Batmutyunk, which has been translated as epic histories, since the Iranian root Buzand signifies a composer of epics. It's still common, though, to see the author referred to as Pastus Buzantaxi or Faustus of Byzantium, although the author seems to have had nothing to do with the East Roman imperial city. In fact, unlike many of the other Armenian historians, such as Agathangelos, who turned to Western Greek Christian models. The author of this history is one of the few historians to draw on Iranian, specifically Parthian, and Semitic, specifically Syriac models. The author narrates the fourth century wars between the Parthian Arsacid dynasty and the Sasanians in the fashion of Parthian epic, overlaid with his own Syriac influenced Christian perspective. As such, the text bears witness to an Irano-Semitic form of Christian culture that was prevalent in many sectors of Armenia. Whereas the history of Agathangelos uh, bears witness to the Greek Cappadocian influence on early Armenian Christianity, the epic histories reveal the impact of the earlier spread of Christianity into Armenia via the Syriac world. As some of you may know, many of the basic technical vocabulary of the new faith were also borrowed from Syriac at this early time, such as the word for priest, 
Armenian Kahana, exactly the same in Syriac. And uh, do you know Hebrew Kohen or the last name Kohen, Kohen? Indeed, the earliest Christian inroads to the Armenian realm came by Assyriac missionaries from nearby centers in Mesopotamia, such as Edessa, Urfa, Urfa. The Armenian version of the doctrine of Adai thus extends the mission of the apostle in Armenian Tadeos to Armenia, where he spreads the Christian faith in various parts of the realm and even to the royal court. Sandukht, the daughter of then Armenian king Sanatruk, is converted, and shortly thereafter, she and Tadeos are martyred. Sandukht is thus remembered as the first female Christian martyr of Armenia, and the apostleship and martyrdom of St. Tadeos lends apostolic validity to the Armenian church, one among a few apostles to do so. This author knows about some of those traditions that predate Gregory the Illuminator and talks about them in the beginning of his work. It's in part due to all this Syriac Iranian influence in the history that it was disliked by Vazar and later pro-Western writers in the Armenian tradition and was largely neglected until more recent times. Also because Moses Horonazi's history covered the same period and that became the canonical uh, representation. And so this work was less uh, read. Um, this, if you're able to get a copy of this book, so down there published by uh, Harvard University Press, I think of all the histories, it's the best edition that's been made. Um, it's because it was a group effort by basically all the top <laughs> armenologists of the day. So Nina Garsoyan's name is on the cover, um, but really it was a team effort. There was Peter Cowie, James Russell, Professor Roberta Irving, um, Parakrikor Maksudian, Robert Hewson. Basically, everyone contributed to putting together this translation and more than the translation. So the translation stops about here. And the rest of it is appendices and commentary and uh, descriptions of technical terms and language and vocabulary that um, is some of the best information you can find on fourth century Armenian uh, society, religion. Um, it's incredibly detailed and uh, just a fantastic uh, study. So there are three discernible strands in the epic histories. First, what has been called the royal history, which tells of the reigns of the last Arshakuni kings. Second, the ecclesiastical history, which tells of the hereditary succession of the patriarchs in the line of Gregory. And third, the Mamigonian history, which stresses the valor and loyalty of this family. Based on this latter emphasis, we can see the text as issuing from the fifth century when the Mamigonian family takes over as the leading family of the era in the wake of the fall of the Arshakuni kingdom. Some of the principal themes that stand out in the work are the opposition between the patriarchs of Armenia and the Arshakuni kings, the centrifugal tendencies of the Nahara families, the noble lords, meaning that each pursued their own self-serving policy instead of a unified one, and the detrimental effect that that had on the Armenian realm as a whole. It also dwells on the activities and affairs of individual Nahara families and gives many uh, just fascinating short little hagiographical biographies and episodes which often have the flavor of oral popular literature. So the episode I chose for us to read is one of the famous ones about the death of King Arshak of Armenia, who had been captured by Shah Shapur for disloyalty and confined in the fortress of oblivion. So I just think that's the greatest name ever for a fortress. <laughs> so, and this is from the Sophene Books edition. So this is, you know, this other one, I, it's still in print, I think, uh, from Harvard University Press. You can actually buy it. A lot of the older editions, you can't. But here's another good one that it's Robert Bedrosian's translation, and it has the Armenian text on one side, English on the other. Okay. Let me take, sorry, 
So regarding the death of Arshak, king of the Armenians, how he died by his own hand at Anhush fortress in the country of Khuzestan, and how Drastamat became the cause of his death. In that period, King Arshak of Armenia was still alive in the country under the authority of the Kingdom of Iran in the Khuzestan areas at And. At And. <laughs> at And Meshan Fortress, which was called Anhushan Bert. So, um, the Fortress of Oblivion. In this period, the Iranians stopped warring with the Armenians, since the Arsacid king of the Kushans, who resided in the city of Bakh, was warring against the Sasanian king Shapu of Iran. The king Shapu assembled all of the Iranian troops and took them to fight against him and took at the same time all the captive cavalry from the country of Armenia. They even took with them the eunuch of King Arshak of Armenia to fight. There was a eunuch of Arshak, King of Armenia, who was a royal Vostigon, one of the officials in the court, a eunuch beloved and possessing a great principality and great honor who was named Drastamat. Now, when the war commenced, the Iranian troops were wickedly scattered by the Kushan troops. Many of the Iranians were arrested, while the rest fled, chased out. It happened that the eunuch Drastamat was involved in the war. He had, during the years of Diran, king of Armenia, and Arshak, his son, been prince of the Dun, uh, noble house, of the district, and loyal to the treasures of Anger fortress and all the royal fortresses in those parts. Similarly, the treasures at Bunabel fortress in the Zop country were under him. His barts, which is the cushion um, that the nobles would sit on when they're at a royal ceremony. And so then it also re can refer to like their rank because you would sit in, the, in, the, in your rank, according to the order of your rank, your like honor. The hierarchy. So his parts was higher than those of all the other Nafaras. Since this office and the Mard Badutun, uh, another <laughs> official office, was called higher, had been entrusted to eunuchs from the beginning period of the Arsacid kingdom. This eunuch, Drastamat, the prince of Angerthun, had been taken captive to the country of Iran at the time that King Arshak of Armenia had been seized. And so if your head's spinning already with all these uh, social terminology and political terminology for things, that's why um, over half of this book is devoted to explaining what all those terms mean and how the society uh, worked. Drastamat happened to be in the battle in which the Kushans defeated King Shapu of Iran. Drastamat displayed incredible bravery and even saved King Shapu from death. He killed many of the Kushans and brought the heads of many champions before the king. He saved King Shapu of Iran when the latter was surrounded by enemies during the fighting. Now, when King Shapu of Iran returned to the Asuristan country, to like Mesopotamia, he greatly thanked the eunuch Drastamat for his labors. And King Shapu of Iran said to him, ask for whatever you want and I will grant it without delay. So here's the situation, the king of Armenia who was uh, disloyal or at enmity with the king of Iran is imprisoned in the fortress of oblivion for years and years. This faithful eunuch who used to serve the Armenian king is taken along with all these other Armenian nobles and cavalry to go fight this other war the Shah is engaged in. And that eunuch distinguishes himself with all these heroic deeds on the battlefield, including saving the life of the Shah himself. So what's gonna happen? Obviously the Shah is gonna say, tell me what you want as a reward and it's yours. So what's he gonna ask for? Um, Rastamat said to the king, I want nothing from you, but that you order that I go to see my natural Lord, King Arshak of Armenia. For the one day that I am with him, order that he be released from his bonds and I shall wash his head, anoint and dress him in a robe. I shall place him on a couch and put delicacies before him. Give him wine and make him happy with musicians just for one day. 
King Shapur replied, what you ask for is difficult. For from the time that the Iranian kingdom was established and that fortress was named Anhush, no one has dared to remind the kings about people whom they have put there. No one has recalled a prisoner there to say nothing of this prisoner who was a king, my comrade, but now my bound adversary. You have taken your life into your own hands by mentioning Anhush. Such a thing has not happened from the beginning of the Aryan kingdom, Iranian kingdom. However, because the labors you performed for me were great, what you have request, requested will be given to you. Go, but you should have asked for something to benefit yourself, such as lands, districts, or treasures. What you requested is outside the laws of the Aryan kingdom, but go. What you requested will be given to you in exchange for your help. So Shapu gave him a reliable Kustipan bodyguard and a Hrovar dog, a royal decree, with the court seal to allow him to go uh, to Andmesh Fortress and do as he requested for the bound Arshaf, who had formerly been the king of Armenia. Rastamat went with the bodyguard and the court decree to Anhush Fortress and saw his native lord. He released Arshak from the iron shackles on his hands and feet and the chains of his neck collar. He washed his head and body, dressed him in a noble robe, sat him on a couch and made him recline. Before him, he placed food befitting kings and wine after the custom of kings. He revived and consoled him and made him happy with gusans. Remember, gusans are the oral uh, singers of the pre-Christian uh, context. At dessert time, he put before him fruit, apples, cucumbers, and dainties to eat, and he gave him his knife to peel and eat what he wanted. Drastamat greatly enlivened him. He stood up and consoled him. But when Arshak had drunk the wine and become intoxicated, he grew arrogant and said, Vai, woe is me. Woe is Arshak, look what I have fallen to and what has happened to me. Saying this, he took the knife which he was holding in his hand to cut the food or delicacy and plunged it into his own heart. He died then and there on the couch. Now when Drastamat saw this, he seized the same knife and thrust it into his side, and he died too at the very same hour. So, yeah, this, um, this text is full of these just kind of, again, very compelling <laughs> narratives and scenes, and also um, these little snippets that provide very rich detail on customs of um, royal banqueting, eating, norms, even just these kind of daily life things that are interesting to discover. Um, so we can talk about that more at the end too. So the third and last one we'll talk about, Bov Ses Koronazi, called the father of history, Batmahai, is the author of a renowned history that chronicles Armenian origins from its legendary beginnings up until the mid fifth century. His version became the normative view of Armenian origins and early history from the Middle Ages up until the present day. No history is more popular in the Armenian tradition, and yet none also has been more surrounded by controversy. The author self-identifies as a pupil of Mesrop Mashtots, inventor of the Armenian alphabet, and as one widely traveled in major intellectual cities like Alexandria and Constantinople. He says that he composed his history from archival records at the request of Sahak Bagratuni, a fifth century Armenian noble lord. However, most modern scholars view his work as an eighth century composition and his claim to have investigated otherwise unknown archival sources as a literary device. This debate over authorship and date and sources uh, has been vicious at times and has obstructed the appreciation of the work in modern times. 
rather than rehash these debates and in so doing get lost in a dead end that ultimately would be of little value. Let's try to get at this cryptic author's purposes. So what can we say about the text? Well, let's look at an outline first. So it's divided into three books. The first weaves together native Armenian origin stories with material mostly from Genesis and Eusebius's Chronicon, placing Armenian history in both a biblical and global context in an original synthesis that became the canonical self-understanding of later generations. The second book traces the foundation of the Armenian kingdom and early kings through the Hellenistic period and up until the conversion of the royal house by Gregory the Illuminator. The third covers the Arsacid dynasty from the fourth century up until its fall in the fifth, the career of Mashtots and Sahak, and the beginnings of the Armenian literary tradition. Along the way, the achievements and significance of the Bagratuni family is emphasized, revealing the desires of the patrons to have themselves presented as the preeminent Armenian noble family of the past at the expense of the Momigonians. There is also a pronounced focus on genealogies and origins, topics that are especially critical in a social setting marked by aristocratic landholders who vie for prestige with one another over the glory of their ancient pedigrees. These topics are also still relevant in the Caucasus today, a region that as we know is marked by uncompromising nationalistic claims about the past. So what was Moses up to in his larger project, particularly in the most famous book one that treats ancient history and genealogy? Let's think about this from a literary perspective. If you think about it, Agathangelos starts with Gregory, the Christianization of Armenia. Hofstos picks it up from there. As we'll see next week, Yelishe and Lazar take it from there, fifth century, and other subsequent historians continue to tell the story of their own times. What's missing? Well, what's missing is Armenian history before Christianization, the origin of the people, their relation to other ancient peoples and kingdoms, mythology, and other topics that still fascinate us all today. As is clear from certain indications in the text, there were oral traditions and stories all about such things that were known and transmitted among the people orally. But these issued from the pre-Christian pagan milieu. As for written sources, there are references in the Bible to Armenia and Armenians, as well as in Greek historians and sources like Herodotus, Xenophon, and others. But these are written from an outsider's perspective and are hardly satisfactory for an insider. Part of Moses's project is to respond to the depiction of Armenia and Armenians in these sources, which give an insignificant place to, or at times less than flattering picture of Armenia. Following in a tradition of other apologetic histories, like the one Josephus constructed for the Jews, Barosis for Babylon or Manetho for Egypt, Moses seeks to promote the glory and significance of the Armenian people in a form that would be palatable to a contemporary international audience, to give his people a history they can be proud of. And for more on that topic, um, you should read this excellent article by Abraham Terrion called Horonazi and Eastern Historiography of the Hellenistic Period. And I shared the um, citation in the uh, document from last time, and that's also in the chat. And I can send you a PDF if you want to read it. So in order to do this, Moses also had to rework the insider material, that mostly oral and pagan traditions and stories about the Armenian past. What makes his task so difficult and his accomplishment so impressive is that none of this mass of material was consistent with each other. Everything was contradictory. 
While the oral material was, in a certain sense, more authentic and native, it was inconsistent with the version of creation and prehistory found in the Bible, as well as ancient history known from Western Greek histories. So Moses's great genius was to synthesize the oral traditions and Armenian prehistory together with the version of sacred history as found in the Bible into a form that fit with the new Christian literary culture and sensibilities. This version gives Armenians an ancient history that is harmonized with the ancient mythology of the Bible, yet still retains the local Armenian traditions and mythology, albeit in a modified form. In so doing, he rescued the mythological pagan oral past from total oblivion and composed a version of prehistoric Armenia that was so compelling that it has become canonical from the time it first appeared until the present day. So there was a need for an ancient written history of Armenia and Moses supplied it. We might compare, this could be a stretch, but I'm just gonna try it. <laughs> Moses's project in book one to Washington Irving's similar project in the early 19th century to provide an epic mythological history of New York as that city was trying to compete for prestige on the international stage with the great cities of Europe, such as Rome, but lacked an ancient history and mythology. So Washington Irving, proud New Yorker that he was, invented one, drawing on far more fictitious material than Moses Kodanazi was. It's entitled A History of New York from the Beginning of the World to the End of the Dutch Dynasty. And like Moses's history, Washington Irving's also has a made up narrator named Diedrich Knickerbocker, who begins with a cosmogony, creation of the world, and proceeds into an ancient history, weaving together the story of the native uh, Americans around the New York region with that of other ancient peoples, such as Assyrians, Greeks, Jews, Romans, Chinese, and others until coming to Columbus and the early Dutch settlers. The book was a raging success, even though it was much more obviously fictitious than some of the material in the first book of Moses's history. And its presence and influence remains in New York today. For example, the, the Knickerbockers was the term that he gave to the original Dutch settlers and inhabitants, and that's where the New York Knicks, uh, the basketball team, get their name. So let's just take a really brief look at one very small example from uh, to see the way that Moses kind of weaves the ancient history into biblical history. This is one of the most famous. Uh, yeah, to and it's also interesting to see in his description of how he talks about how difficult it is what he's doing is. So if you start at five, he says, it's clear to all that nothing is so difficult to compile and so laborious as the investigation of the times from the beginning to our own day. And even more so the investigation of the lineage of the patriarchal lines from the three sons of Noah. So long as it is desired to examine any given one in his own age, especially because divine scripture has separated its own as its special nation and left aside the genealogies of the others as contemptible and unworthy of being set out in its own account. Do you get what he's saying? That so the Bible starts out being about the whole history of the world and all its peoples. Everyone descends from these three sons of Noah. But then it just picks Shem and decides to focus on one of his descendants, obviously Israel, the Jewish people, and then just acts as if none of the other peoples matter at all. So what Moses is doing is creating a version of sacred history to fill the gaps and say, what if there was as much a focus on Armenia as Israel, or, you know, he's doing it for Armenia, same could be done for other peoples. We shall begin our exposition with these as far as possible, and according to what we have found to be trustworthy from old histories, and on our part with absolutely no falsification. 
So do you, attentive reader, look now at the harmony of the order of the three races up to Abraham, Minos, and Adam, and Marvel. And so then you have the genealogies. And of course, uh, as we know, the Armenians descend from Japheth over here. Um, the biblical genealogy uh, basically gives Gamar, Tiras, Tiras, Torgum, Togarma, and then I think it stops there. And then um, he fills these in, Haig, um, all the way to Ara, and um, he wasn't actually inventing those traditions wholesale. There's already mention of Armenians as belonging to the house of Torgom in earlier writers. Um, and so anyway, he does similar things with the story of Haig and Bell, uh, yeah, Haik and Bell and uh, Ara and Shemiras and some of the other ancient kind of oral stories. He weaves it all together into a continuous narrative. So there you have a brief intro to three of the earliest histories of Armenia. One, the canonical story of Christianization, Agathangelos. One, the canonical mythology and prehistory of the people, Moses Koronazi, and the other, a fascinating look at the situation of Armenian church and society in the fourth century, the epic histories, as the newly Christianized people comes to terms with their new faith in a tumultuous political and religious setting. And so next time we'll look at Lazar and Yereshe and their depiction of the religious wars of the fifth century. Thank you.